Hi, this is Jose Luis here and welcome to another video in this series Advanced Development in Grasshopper. For this exercise hands-on video, what I would like to do is I would like to put to practice some of the things we've learned in the previous video where we saw how to generate custom previews and custom renderings on the screen for Grasshopper components. And I would like to put that to practice with a few exercises, such as, for example, extending the example that we did for visualizing vectors to uh, display the length instead of in the tiny corner here, I would like to display it in 3D and keep the orientation to the camera that we are viewing. And also with controllable parameters, such as the color of the arrow, or for example, the size of that text on the screen or whether if it shows up or not in the first place. So that would be a, an extension of that. I would also like to show you how to create graph analysis graphs. That, that was very redundant. So how to display the idea, how to display those graphs, those nice graphs that Rhino generates for uh, the curvature of a, of a curve this is actually going to be super straightforward and be able to then customize you know the size and the samples etc etc that's going to be super cool as well and then this is probably the most important part of this exercise the one that took the longest to record is going to be also the idea that for any particular surface what i can do is that i can also preview on that surface let me hide this i can preview on that surface things such as for example the Gaussian curvature. The Gaussian curvature being a measure of how a surface is uh, very concave or, a very con or, or is very convex, all right, and which areas it is one or the other. Um, this is a very interesting exercise to do because in order to represent this and render this, it relies on using this technique called a false color mesh, which is basically meshing the surface, the nerve surface, and to each one of the vertices apply a color that represents whatever we want to analyze. In this case, Gaussian curvature. It's a bit more tedious, but it uses this other function that we didn't see in the previous video, which is draw mesh previews. All right. That's going to be useful, for example, for curvature, or for example, if I want to do an exercise where I, what I take is any mesh with quad pa panels or with triangular panels. And what I render is a graph of the planarity or how much of an offset each one of the, of the faces of the mesh has. So you can see that in this one, for example, what we can render is for each one of the quads, each one of the uh, square faces of this mesh, we can color it with a value of red that represents how non-planar it is. So we can see that for this surface, this area is very flat. You can see that these areas in the slope of the hills are very curvy. And we can see that actually very interestingly, because of the nature of how we drew this, these stripes of faces here are also fairly planar compared to the other ones, which I think is extremely, extremely cool, if you ask me. So all with things you're going to learn in this exercise is doing custom previews. But at the same time, we're going to spend quite some time in Re, um, learning this technique, the false color vertex technique for meshes, which is extremely, extremely popular and very widely used to color meshes up according to particular analysis, solar analysis, energy analysis, geometry analysis, like the ones we're going to be doing in this exercise, etc. etc. So I welcome you to join this. It's going to take uh, some time, but I'm going to be using a lot of diagrams and explain things conceptually. So you may actually learn uh, a lot of new stuff with the excuse of doing custom previews. All right. And without further ado, let's dive in and let's get our hands dirty into custom preview components scripted in C sharp within Rhino and the grasshopper environment. Let's get started. The first component that we're going to do is going to be an extension of the component that we did in a previous video, which is going to be a custom rendering for a particular vector. And in order to do that, I've already pre-added some code here. If I created a point uh, in Grasshopper that I have internalized, and then I can move it here in the Rhino viewport. And then I have created a vector from custom, uh, from custom components. We can't really see it yet. That's what we're going to be doing in this exercise. And then I created a simple C-sharp script component that takes 
an anchor point and takes a vector and will hopefully render that vector in three-dimensional space with a custom preview. So as we're going to follow a very similar structure to what we did in the previous, in, in the previous video, I'm going to add all the overrides that define custom preview parameters, okay? And then what I'm going to do is that I'm going to take, I'm going to create two global variables in the C sharp script component that are going to keep the values of the point uh, and the vector. And I'm going to then use those global variables to read and to generate the custom viewports, the, the custom viewport wires, all right? So I'm going to create a point, I'm going to create a point 3D object P, uh, and that's going to, uh, uh, now that's going to be the anchor, all right? And then I'm going to create a vector 3D object, which is going to be the vector. And then every time the component executes, what I want to do is I want to assign to that global variable, I want to assign the value that is coming in, and to the other vector global variable, I want to also assign the value that is coming into the component. I need to do this because, again, these two components, these two functions, the functions that do custom preview, are outside of the run script method, and therefore, these functions do not have access, do not have, are not in the same scope as the arguments, the inputs that come to the component. That's why I need to do this process of taking the information that is coming into the component and making it globally, making it globally accessible by copying or by transferring it to a variable that is in the global scope. All right, we saw that in the previous video. And then in order to draw the, um, the arrow, it's going to be just as simple as saying, well, let me add arguments, display, and then is there draw an arrow, and then the arrow takes a line as an input, all right? So we, right now, we don't have a line. So something that we can do is we can say, well, um, maybe what I can do is I can create a line object that I'm going to call an arrow that's going to be global. And then what I can do is also during the execution of the component, I can say the arrow is going to be a new line that goes from anchor to and, and uses the vector as the direction. Okay. And then I can use that arrow object. And then for the time being, I'm just going to be using system drawing color and for example, coral. All right. Uh, I'm going to execute this. And if I turn the pre-visualization on, you can see that I can see my, uh, I can see my arrow. All right. That's good. Now I'm going to also, if you remember in the previous video, we said that it's important that we set the clipping box because if I make this arrow too big, the viewport may not be rendering the whole area, the whole volume of the arrow. And then the arrow might be missing the time, the actual arrow or some part of it. So it's important in the clipping box method to make sure that we add, that we calculate a bounding box that contains all the geometry that we want to render with this preview. The way we can do that is we can say, well, uh, whenever you calculate a bounding box, I want you to, cal to calculate the bounding box of the line object so that the whole line is inside of the visible bounding box of this preview. So what I can do is I can say, uh, can you give me the bounding box of the arrow? And it's going to have no visual effect here because we already were seeing the whole arrow, but uh, it's going to make the whole process more resilient, All right? Now, this is what we did previously. And in the previous example, we also added the length here in the tiny corner, uh, in the tiny corner here. But what I want to do is I want to expand this exercise and add perhaps a few more inputs. So for example, um, I would like to control the color of the arrow. So I would not like to be this, I would not like this color to be hard coded. I would like the user to be able to control that color. I would also imagine we have a, a lot of arrows and we're previewing all of them. If we have the text here, all the text would be drawing on top of each other and it will get very messy, it will be really unreadable. So something that I also want to do is I want to display the text kind of at the tip of the arrow so that uh, we can see which, which text, which length belongs to each arrow and um, whether if we want to display that or not. So 
Let me set up a few things here and then we can continue the exercise. As you can see, I have taken the time to add a few input parameters. So that's one of them is going to be a color that I'm creating with the grasshopper component, color RGB, which outputs basically three numbers that go from zero to 255, uh, representing a color in the RGB space. Um, in the C Sharp script component, I have added three inputs. One is going to be C, so that's going to be the color that we want to color the arrow with. L is going to be whether if we want to display the length of the vector or not. So that's going to be a Boolean, and I got it here. And um, size is going to be the size, this is going to be the size of the, um, of the text for the length of the arrow, okay? I have done it CLS and I need to make sure to remember to type these inputs. So here is going to be item and then the type is going to be, you're not seeing it, it's showing up on my other screen. The type is going to be, for this one, is going to be of the type color from the system. L is going to be a Boolean and S is just going to be a double. All right. Beautiful. So because all of this, the color, the, the color, the Boolean, the size, all of this is information that is going to be needed in these global methods. I'm going to do the same technique. I'm going to create variables in the global scope um, to, to handle them, to store them, and then I'm going to pass that information to the global variables. So I'm going to say, for example, I want to create a variable of the type. And if you don't want to be typing system drawing color all the time, you can use, um, you can say, I'm going to import system drawing or is it system? Yes, I'm going to import system drawing and I'm going to say a variable of the type color and then a Boolean that is going to be display length and then a double that is going to be size. And then here for color, I'm going to pass in the value of C for display display length. I'm going to pass the value of L and for size, I'm going to pass the value of S. Therefore, now those values are available in the global scope. And if I run this, I don't have any problems. So that's great. So now, well, first thing, what can I do? Well, I can pass here the color. I can use the color that we have as a global variable now. So I'm going to replace this with color. And if I hit execute, you can see the arrow changes colors. And now if we just modify this, you can see how the arrow is shifting colors and I can do it pure white now. Oh, and it just kind of disappears with my background. All right, or I can make it like super bright pink. Okay, so that is color control. Now let's take a look at displaying the length. If you remember, in the previous video, we did something like this. We, did, we said, well, args, arguments, display, and then I want to draw text, all right? And then, um, was this the only option? I actually forget, draw to the text, okay? And we did something along the lines of, uh, what is it that I want to draw? So let's look at the arguments. So what is it that I want to draw? Um, so the text, the color of the text and where on the screen it was going to be showing up and whether if, so for example, who, and then the color, I'm going to use the same color for the arrow and then the, the screen coordinate, let's say that because it's in pixel space, I'm going to say new point 2D and it's going to be, for example, I don't know, 100 and 100. Okay. For example, and if I do that, uh, I get an error because it takes three arguments. It needs another argument, which is whether if it's middle justified or not. And you can see foo here and I can say become and then it shows up there. All right. But you can see that it's 2D text is static on the screen. What I want is to actually draw the text here at the tip of the arrow. So how can I do that? What I can do is instead of drawing 2D text, there's another function that is called draw 3d text let's take a look at the arguments oh it's a lot of stuff so what is this is this uh can do we have all this information is the text oh my god is the text is the color is the plane in which we want to draw this the font face the ball there's a lot of stuff can can we make it easier 
So, for example, this one could work. So let's say string text, color, a plane, the height and the font face. Or even this one looks also very good. The text, the color and the plane, just that. Um, or the point 3D text plane origin. So this could also work. So let's prototype this, okay? So I'm going to say 3D text and then the color is also going to be the same color and I think it was asking for a point, correct? So what we need is the point at the tip of the arrow. So that we can find very easily by saying the, the point at the tip of the arrow is the anchor point plus the vector. So I'm going to do this, all right? We're going to render that. We are having some problems. What is What are the errors that I'm getting? So let me plug in a panel here so that we can all see the errors. The errors are invalid arguments cannot convert from string to text 3D, cannot convert from point to geometry. So it looks like I'm not working with the uh, inputs correctly. So let me cut this out and go back to, it was text 3D, oh yeah, because the object is a text 3D object that already contains a lot of information. So information about the 3D text. So let's try this one instead. So I'm going to do 3D text, 3D text, and then color, and then text. The, I'm going to start with a plane in the world XY. We will change that, okay? And then height is going to be the size that I'm bringing in as an input. And then the font face, uh, let me say courier new, all right, for example. And because it's going to start getting complex, I'm actually going to do this where I'm going to put all the arguments one after the other. Remember, C sharp is not uh, sensitive to white spaces. So you can do this. Uh, so it's working. I'm getting some 3D text. You can see that it's 3D, right? And then you can see that if I change the size of the text, it's making it bigger or smaller. But the text is showing up here on the uh, world coordinate. And I want it here at the very tip. So improvements. So let's say before here, let's try to calculate the plane, the plane that we're going to use for drawing this text, okay? The plane is going to be a, for example, we're going to start with plane world x, y, and then we're going to change for the plane, we're going to change the origin, and we're going to make it the anchor point plus the vector, so that the plane, instead of being here, is at the tip of the vector. If I do that, and then I, and then I remember to use the, actually that plane for the arguments, then we're going to get something like this, which is a 3D text that is now at the tip of the vector, which is getting closer to what I want, but I think we can do a little bit better. We can do a little bit better because what I would like to do is I would like to have the text always face the camera or face my view in a way that, um, that it doesn't feel like it's projected on some other plane, but it's just perfectly frontal to my point of view. Now, how are we going to do that? Let me show that what we're going to do with a small sketch. From a conceptual standpoint, what we have right now is something like this. We have a three-dimensional coordinate system where we have an object. This is this vector, right? And then what we also have, if you think about it, is that in order to view this vector from our Rhino viewport, with this perspective, et cetera, et cetera, kind of view. We also have this virtual object somewhere that is um, a camera-like object, which basically has a location in 3D space and it has like a direction. So we're looking at somewhere and it has all these other properties, the field of view, the first room, like all this other stuff, right? But it's basically um, a point and an arrow, a direction. It has like all these common geometrical properties, orientation, et cetera, et cetera, that we are used to. So if what we want, uh, in one of the other things that it has is that it has orientation in three-dimensional space because it, the camera is somewhere in the three-dimensional coordinate system and it's looking somewhere, we can very easily figure out a plane with that location and with the orientation of the camera 
that uh, matches that field of view, that matches that view for the camera. So if what we want is to create text that has a frontal projection on top of that camera view that we are currently using, then basically what it's going to boil down to is as simple as creating a plane on top of where we want to draw the text, so the end of the arrow, and so the location is going to change, but the orientation of that plane, keep it exactly parallel to the orientation that we currently have for the camera that we're, the virtual camera that we're using for viewing our environment. And then as, as long as we use that plane to just write text, then on our camera view, that text is going to look perfectly frontal, again, because the plane that we're using is parallel to the plane that defines the camera that we're using for the view. So it's just going to be as simple as that. Now, how do we find the plane that is defining the camera? Well, we're going to use a little bit of the Rhino and the Grasshopper SDK to figure out how to get that. Let's see how to make that happen. So remember where here we created a plane and then we manually turned it into an XY plane and we changed the orientation, blah, blah, blah. We're going to do something very, very similar. So what we're going to do is I'm going to cancel this out and I'm going to say, first of all, let me find where the plane that defines the camera is. Turns out that the arguments parameter, it's, it contains a lot of very useful information and some of that information relates to the viewport that we're using. So for example, I can go to the args argument and say, well, if I take a look at the viewport, there's a lot of method that tell me where the location is, where the target is, the length and blah, blah, blah. But something that I can get do is I can get the camera frame. So the value, the, the plane that defines this camera. And you can see that the, the output is one of these out reference um, parameters. What that means is that we the return type of this function is a Boolean. So whether if I the function could get that plane or not. And the way to actually retrieve that plane is by passing it out to a plane that we predefined before and that we assign a value to as a result of the execution of this method. Uh, we have in the channel, we have a video on how to use out parameters and what they mean. Uh, a link to that video will be showing up as a card here in the corner and there will be in the description of this video as well. So here we have that plane. And now that we have that plane, we can just use it right away. Uh, uh, well, we kind of forgot that that plane is actually right now on the camera. And because it's right behind the camera, we can't see it. So let's make sure that we change the, the origin of that plane. So we're going to say plane PL, oops, PL dot origin is going to be equal to what we did before the anchor plus the vector so that the plane is at the tip of the arrow. And as I do that, what? Look at this text that is rotating with my point of view, right? How awesome is that? We can make it, we can push it a little farther away if we say, well, let me multiply the vector by 1.1 or 1.2 or something that pushes the text a little farther out. All right. Beautiful. And then the last thing we need to do is actually this text should be the length of the vector. So let me just calculate that. So double length is going to be equal to arrow dot. Can we get the length of the line? Yes, we can get the length of the line. We don't even have to be to do Pythagoras here. And then here I can do length dot to string. All right. However, Okay, this is going to give me like a ton of decimals. So maybe what I want to do is I want to make sure that I only display three decimals, for example. So let me say, let me do this manually myself. So I'm going to create a string here that is going to be the length rounded nicely. And then I'm going to use from the C sharp framework, I'm going to use formatting tools. So I'm going to say from the string object, the parent global string object, I want to format a string with a particular formatting. Um, in C sharp, there are all these rules about how you can format decimals, money, dates, it's kind of um, 
It's not complicated, it's just tedious. And I, I never remember any of this. But I know that for rounding numbers, um, we can do this format. So we can say, well, I want the value to just have three decimal parts. So if I use this string as the template that defines that formatting, then whatever value I pass now, so for example, length, will be formatted with these three decimals. Okay. And again, I know this because I basically Googled it out before doing this exercise. But uh, th there's there's a lot of documentation on how you can properly format strings, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. That's actually something that varies very strongly depending on different languages. So this is a very C sharp way of doing that. And then here, instead of that, I'm just going to output that manually rounded number that I have generated. Okay. Uh, I can control the size, so I can make this value bigger or smaller. And, um, and I also would like to make sure that this on and off turns off the visualization or not. So, um, so then I guess that's going to be just as easy as saying, if display text, display length, then do all this stuff that we just designed, otherwise don't do it. Okay, otherwise just skip that part. So if I now turn this false, no text is displayed. And if I turn it on, this text is displayed. So we have uh, a bit more of a, an enhanced vector display visualization than the one that comes uh, out of the box with Grasshopper. All right, we could get some inspiration from the actual Grasshopper component because this one, so for example, this one takes the color. We've, we've done that already. This one also takes the width of the vector's line. So how, how thick the line is, we could do that as well. But I'm actually going to leave that to you, the viewer, as an exercise, if you want to practice adding more parameters here. Okay? Because I would like to move on to the next component, which is going to be, um, I forget. Well, I'm going, let's move on to the next component, whatever that was on, on my list. Yes, 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 I forgot. What I wanted to do was to show you how to draw the curvature graph of a curve using also Grasshopper previous pre-visualization. What does that mean? What it means is, I don't know if you're familiar with this, but you can, if you draw a curve in Rhino, for example, let me turn off, let me turn off all this vector stuff. If you draw a curve in Rhino, for example, there's this in Rhino, there is this component or this action that is called curvature graph which if I choose it on this curve and I crank up the scale a little bit, what it does is that it draws this diagram on top of the curve that is a visual representation of the curvature of this, of this curve. The curvature is basically the inverse of the radius that you would need for a circle to mimic the curvature of that curve at that particular point. So you can see that um, when the circle that we would need to be tangent to these points is very large, then the curvature is actually very small. But you can see how as the curve becomes more curvy, if you will, this value increases. The curve is very curvy here, so the curvature is very high, right? Then the line is, the curve is almost straight here, so the curvature is very small, and then it goes higher here, right? And you can see that there's actually jumps in the rate at which the curvature is changing based on the based on the control points of the curve. So you can see this is actually quite interesting. So you can see how where the control points for this nerves curve that I just drew where the control polygon hits the curve. So at the middle of here, 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 there's actually jumps in the curvature for uh, reasons that I have explained in other videos about how nerves curves work, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. But displaying this as an analysis is actually quite interesting. And in Grasshopper, it's actually super, super easy to do. So you can see that this panel asks me for a few uh, data. So the scale of the display, the density, the curl, the color of the graph. So I have mimicked all of that in this C sharp script component where I'm going to be input in a curve right here, then I have a color for the display of this curve. And then I have, uh, I forget what was this like the size of the um, I have it here somewhere. 
S is going to be the scale of the hair, HD is going to be the density of the hair, and then SD is going to be the, the density of the samples. All right. And I've already done what we discussed in previous videos. I have created global variables in the scope of this component and that I'm using to store copies of the input information that we are bringing in here. Okay, so very simple. So how are we going to do this? It's going to be the simplest of all the exercises. I'm going to add the overrides here. And then what I'm going to do is, first of all, I'm going to go all the way to arguments here where we draw viewport wires. And then I'm going to say arguments, display and I'm going to say draw, literally there is draw curvature graph there's literally a function that does this all for us we could do it manually we could find the curvature draw the curves draw the line it would be a fantastic exercise on how to do that manually but I'm actually going to leave that to you <laughs> and the viewer to do that on your own okay because um, it's it's not so straightforward um, it would probably deserve its own video so I'm going to draw the curvature graph and I'm going to go through the uh, overloads and I can see that there's already one that has the curve, the color and all the properties. So I'm just going to go straight into it. So curve is going to be the curve that I want to draw. Color is going to be the color, then the hair scale. Then this is going to be the hair density and then it's going to be the sample density. And if I don't have, you see that I had a typo already. If there's no typos on my end, this should already be working. So I'm going to turn the previsualization. Oh, and something is showing up. So let me crank down the scale and let me up the hair density. And the sample density is not doing anything for some reason. I don't know what that, what, why it's that important anyway. But you can see that I'm already getting the graph as expected. Okay. So that one was just a one off. That was so simple. We have to remember though, that in the bounding box, we have to make sure that we at least include the curve. So we need to say this should at least include uh, get a bounding box and we don't need an accurate bounding box so we can do false. And then we make, we just do that to make sure that the viewport is not going to clip out parts of the curve. All right, beautiful. So that was great. Now this works, this curvature graph system, this works for, um, this works for curves, but you can also analyze the curvature of surfaces, right? And that's actually much more interesting and also a bit more complex to implement. So how about we try ourselves to create a component that does, um, that displays with colors the curvature of a surface. But first, before we do that, let's actually take a closer look at what displaying the curvature of a surface actually means. Let me first create a surface, the one that we're going to be working with and analyzing the curvature on. In order to do that, um, I'm going to do this surface where I'm going to start, I'm going to loft a few curves to create the surface, but the first few ones are going to be basically straight lines. And I want this because I want to make sure that this area of the surface is as flat as possible so that it has very little curvature. But then I want this other area to have a lot of curvature so that I can see the contrast between this. So that's why I'm going to be lofting a surface between these five straight lines and then this really curvy one here. So I'm going to say loft and between this one, this one, this one, this one, and you see, and then you can see how this area is, you see, there's still like a little bit of a valley here and a, and a top here, but it's almost flat, right? Whereas compared to this one here, that it has a lot of curvature. So if I take this surface and now I type curvature uh, analysis, what you can see is that I get this thing here. I get this color representation that tells me which areas of the surface have more curvature and which areas have the least, right? And you can see that curvature in this case is the Gaussian curvature. The Gaussian curvature, it's, we haven't seen that in the channel yet, but it's basically a measure of how concave or how convex a surface is. And when it approaches zero, it's basically very flat. So you can see how this area is, 
has almost close to zero curvature. And you can see how the sides of these heels are also pretty flat, which is kind of interesting. But you can see how the red areas are areas that are very concave, so it has positive curvature in both directions, whereas the blue areas are areas that are very saddle-like. So it has negative Gaussian curvature, so it has those areas have positive curvature in one direction and negative curvature in the other one. I used to have a video about this, but I don't have it anymore, so maybe I will make a, point, a video at some point anyway. I can set auto range here, and then you can see that the values get a little adjusted. Now I can get, I get to see it a little less. I don't like this, actually. Let me go back to 0 0.02 and minus 0 0.02 as a range, all right? Or I could also take a look at the mean curvature. The mean curvature is basically the average of the curvatures in the two principal directions of that surface. And if I do auto range, you can see that this also tells me that this area is pretty flat, these areas on the sides are pretty flat, and then these areas, the, um, these areas are actually increasingly curvy. All right? So what I would like to do is I would like to have a component that generates something like this. It generates a visualization that tells me either mean curvature or Gaussian Gaussian curvature. I don't know how we're going to do that, but it tells me, it gives me an indication of how curvy a surface is. And the way we're going to do that is we're going to follow a technique that is going to be called, um, I forget what the real name is. I, I think it's called a false color mesh. What that means is that many graphical environments cannot really color surfaces. And that's particularly, it, particularly true for nurse geometry. So in order to get this kind of pre-visualizations, what the environments do is that under the hood, behind the scenes, what they do is that they turn this surface into a mesh. So let me show you here. What they do is that they take the surface and under the hood, they turn that surface into a mesh by basically populating the, um, by basically populating the, ver the surface with points at regular intervals and then creating a mesh through all those points. And then what they do is that to every vertex of that mesh, they assign a color value that corresponds to whatever you are trying to represent. Okay, so in this case, curvature. And then we choose colors based on curvature. So maybe for zero curvature, we choose black. And for full curvature, whatever that means, we choose white or we choose these nice color gradients as you, you were seeing before in Rhino. But that is because many graphical environments have a capacity to display meshes that have false color information. I don't think that's the right term, actually. I think I might be making this up, but they have like false color information embedded in the vertices of that mesh. And Rhino happens to be one of those environments. So what we will need to do for this is we will need to take a surface as an input. We will need to create a mesh at regular intervals somehow in that mesh, in that surface. And then for each one of the vertices, calculate the closest point on the surface to that vertex, calculate the curvature on that, sur on that surface at that point, and then turn that curvature value into a color that we attach to the mesh. All right? That sounds like a lot. And so let's, uh, let's take a look at how would we do that code-wise. So I have kickstarted this exercise by creating a C-sharp script component that takes a surface and that takes a double value that I will explain very soon what we're going to be using it for, okay? And then um, I'm just going to basically choose the surface here that I want to do, right? And then I'm going to go into the component and then I'm going to, I just wrote here, um, this is very useful when you do, when you write algorithms that are going to be longer or that are a bit more complex to write yourself what's called pseudocode or like at least a roadmap of what are the things that you want to do. So in our case, in order to achieve this global visualization, what I would like to do is um, I would first, as I explained, what we're going to do is we're going to generate a mesh that is going to be derived from the surface. And it's going to be a grid mesh. I'm going to call it a grid mesh because it's going to be regular in the two directions. I want to do that because I want to sample 
my surface at 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 as regular intervals as possible. So if I make like a messy triangular surface, that would also work. But um, you know, typically we have follow this because it's a bit more regular and you like you have regular I don't even know why <laughs> at this point, but uh, I guess random triangles would also work. But I think this regularity has value when we do these things. Anyway, for each vertex, then of the mesh, what we're going to do is we're going to compute the curvature value of the surface. So we're going to find the closest point to that mesh vertex on the surface. We're going to compute the curvature at that point. And then once we have the curvature of all the vertices, what I'm going to do is I'm going to convert that curvature to a color value that we can attach to the mesh so that we can visualize that. All right. It's going to be uh, a bit more involved than the previous exercises. So in order to make sure that we get a good grasp of what is going on at each step, I'm going to be using the output parameters A and B to output temporary information about this, um, about this. And maybe I actually may leave that information um, out there. Why, why not? Actually, I'm just going to do that right now. I'm just going to say mesh is going to be the mesh that I want to create and C is going to be the curvature values. All right. So let's just stick to that. I like, I kind of like that idea. So first of all, we need to generate a mesh that is derived from the surface. The way I would do that if we had enough time and if, if I didn't want this video to take three hours, <laughs> it would be to manually generate combinations of UV parameters on the surface, then find the point for that UV coordinate on the surface, and then manually recreate a mesh joining point one, point two, point thirteen, point thirteen, etc., etc. That will ensure that the mesh has this regularity that I like, but it's a little bit of a tedious process. It's just long to write. It's not difficult. It's just tedious to write. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use a shortcut and then I'm going to use Rhino's surface to mesh uh, methods that give me already meshes that, um, that give me already meshes from a surface with uh, a few minimal parameters. Okay. So how would I do that? So what I can do is, first of all, I'm going to create a global mesh. All right. So mesh, uh, or, or I'm actually, I'm not going to care about that yet so far. So I'm going to create a mesh and I'm going to say, I'm going to use from the mesh object. I'm going to say create from surface. All right. The surface that I want to use is going to be this one. All right. And if I gave it no parameters, then Rhino would make whatever decisions to create that mesh in whichever form. So let's say that I want to now take a look at that mesh. So I'm going to output it through the M parameter. Okay. And you can see that I get whatever mesh. All right. And if I render that mesh here and I, I hide my surface, I hide my curves and I actually display here that I want to preview the mesh. So if I go to display preview mesh edges, you can see that I now have this representation of the mesh. Now, this doesn't look great to me, first of all, because the intervals between vertices are not so regular. So I have many more vertices in this direction than I have in this other direction. And that is because Rhino is actually optimizing this meshing to create big triangles where the surface is actually pretty flat, as opposed to creating tiny triangles where the surface is very curvy and then I need more definition. It's actually a very smart meshing is a very optimal one, but it's not the one I want. I want something that it's a bit more organized, a bit more grid like I could use this no problem, but I'm going to follow. I'm going to try to find a mesh that is a bit more quad faces uh, re at regular intervals. And I'm also going to do that because I actually want to use that same technique for the last component that we're going to do in this video. So how am I going to do that? Well, if you look at the create mesh surface, it takes has two overloads. One of them is just the surface and then whatever parameters. And then another one is this one that takes an object called meshing parameters. Meshing parameters is an object that contains information about um, what are the parameters that we can tweak and we want to control specifically for the creation of that mesh. 
So what we're going to do is, first of all, I'm going to create meshing I'm going to create a an meshing parameters object that I'm going to initialize to meshing parameters. I'm going to initialize to a default set of values. So you can see that <clears throat> Rhino gives me already a few presets, if you will, I can choose a coarse mesh, a default mesh, that's probably what the what this was doing already. I can do a fast render mesh, quality render mesh, smooth mesh, or the one that I'm going to choose, which is a minimal one. All right, then this, if I were to print this, I wonder if this is going to show any value. So if I were to print this to the console, yeah, I don't get the value. So I don't know what values that are there. But if I were to use that now as the meshing parameters here, you can see that the meshing that I get is actually quite different, right? So first of all, it's made out of quads, which I like, because again, for because of the exercise that we're going to do last in this video, um, yet still has the problem of having many more vertices in this direction than it has in this other direction. So I would like to control that and I would like to change some of the default parameters that come with this. So for example, MP, if I do type, if I do dot, you can see that I can actually access the values of grid angle, maximum count, minimum edge length, etc., tolerance, all those things that already have some presets. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to change the grid aspect ratio and I'm going to ask it to make it as close to one as possible. And then here I'm going to say the maximum edge length must be this value that I input, uh, that I input in the, in, the, um, in the component so that I can choose a more refined mesh or a less refined mesh when I, when I define my visualization. And for the minimum, I'm also going to do the same thing because I want the I want the I want Rhino to give me as square uh, faces as possible. So what I'm going to do that now it's whoa! And now I have <laughs> this like really oversimplified mesh. This is a little too much, but if I now crank this value down, I believe that I can get a more. You see how beautiful is this? How it's not exactly, you see, it's still doing some optimization, but it's much better than what I had before, right? So um, I'm going to keep it at a value of two, for example, or maybe a value of one. A value of one is going to work, 1.5. Not too much, not too little, all right? Beautiful. So the mesh is looking great now. So I have a mesh that I'm happy about. So the next thing that we're going to do is for each vertex of my mesh, I need to compute the curvature value on the surface. How am I going to do that? Well, I'm going to, what I'm going to do is I'm going to write a for loop. I'm going to iterate over all the vertices in the mesh that I created. I'm going to find the closest point on the surface, and then I'm going to measure the curvature on that surface. So for, I'm going to say for int i equals zero. So I'm going to, just to make sure that we're on the same page, I'm going to do here for each vertex compute the part. I'm going to say i is going to be less than the amount of vertices, ver, uh, the amount of vertices in the mesh. Okay, that's one thing. And then what I'm going to do here is I'm going to say, well, first of all, I'm going to get the vertex. So I'm going to say 0.3f. I'm going to explain why in a second. B is going to be mesh dot vertices. And then you see how when I open the square bracket to use the index, the return value is giving me a 0.3F. Turns out that meshes have points with three float values instead of three double values. That's because you don't really need so much precision to store the coordinates of vertices. So we use float points, which have half the memory footprint of double uh, points so of double values. So I'm going to take the vertex there. All right. I'm actually going to rename this vertex. And then the next thing I'm going to do is now that I have the vertex, I want to find the closest point on the surface. So I want to say 
surface. I want to find the closest point on the surface and I can give it a test point that's going to be the vertex. And you can see that the output is not a point. The return of this method is a Boolean, whether if it could compute this point or not. But I have to use out parameters to store the UV coordinate of that point. So I'm going to do out U, out V, and I'm going to predefine those here as two double values. All right. And then I'm going to find, <clears throat> excuse me, and then I could find the point, but I won't really need it because uh, as soon as I say, as soon as I find uh, S dot, as soon as I do curvature at, curvature at doesn't ask me for a point, it asks me for the UV coordinates of where do I want to find the curvature. So that's going to be U and that's going to be V. I want you to look at how the return value of this method is an object called surface curvature. It's not a number because there are many different curvatures. There's Gaussian curvature, mean curvature, etc., etc. So what Rhino does is that it bundles all that information into an object that has all that information and that we can read from. So what I'm going to do then is I'm going to say, well, surface curvature SC is going to be equal to this value. All right. And then from SC, I can probably read the Gaussian curvature, that is a number, the mean curvature, that is a number, the normal to the surface, that's a vector, the oscillating circle, the point, the kappa, there's like a lot of interesting stuff that is bundled in this object, all right? So for the time being, let's say that we're going to choose curvature, the Gaussian curvature, right? So that would be something like this. It would be, that's the value that we will want to represent, okay? Maybe we can add some Boolean to the component, like you want Gaussian or you want mean curvature or something like that. We're not going to do that. I'm going to leave that for you, the viewer. But let's say we want to represent the Gaussian curvature, all right? We can read it, but what I would like to do is actually store it somewhere so that I can use that value later on to compute the color. So then what I'm going to do is, first of all, before uh, I forget, I'm just going to create a, an array here of curvatures, which I'm going to initialize to how many elements. I want to store as many curvatures as vertices I have in my mesh. So that's going to be mesh.vertices.count. All right. And then what I can do now is to the, in the curvatures array at position I, I can store the Gaussian curvature of this surface. All right. And to just make sure that we see what's going on, can I output those curvatures over the C output? So let me just do that. The curvatures, I'm going to output them. And you can see that, boom, I have like a lot of zero curvatures. That's probably these vertices here. But then as I scroll down, I start getting like tiny values, which start becoming larger and larger and larger. And actually, I could use, for example, a list, um, uh, not, not list, a, a range component and to analyze the bounds. So if I pass in this list, this component is going to give me, it's going to give me what is the minimum and what is the maximum of that full list. You can see the minimum is minus 25, 0.25 and the, post, the, the maximum is 0 0.16. All right. Beautiful. Now, how do we turn this into actual colors that live on this surface? Well, let's say we're going to keep it easy. All right. And then what we're going to do is we're going to, for example, we're going to say that the surface will have a black, will have a black color, whatever the Gaussian curvature is minimum. All right. And we're, it's going to have a white color, whatever the Gaussian curvature is maximum. Actually, you know what? I'm going to switch to mean curvature because, uh, yeah, I'm going to switch to mean curvature instead. So, um, well, actually, let me think about what I'm going to do. Give me a second. Sorry, I just thought, I just thought through it. We're going to go back to Gaussian and I will explain later why are we, why was I thinking about this? Anyway, 
So what I would like to do is I would like to use a some kind of rule as in I'm going to draw black color, whatever the minimum Gaussian curvature is, and I'm going to draw um, I'm going to draw white or red or green or some other color, whatever the maximum Gaussian curvature is. In order to do that, I first of all, I need to compute where the minimum and the maximum are. So I can do that as I am calculating the curvature values. What I can say is I'm going to define a, man, a variable called minimum, which is going to be where I store the minimum value of this curvature, which I'm going to initialize to a really large value. I can use, I can do that by just from the double object, just getting whichever the maximum value it can store. And I can do something similar from with for the max. So this I can initialize to the smallest possible value that a double number can take. And then during my for loop, every time I figure out the Gaussian curve, the Gaussian curvature, what I can do is I can say if sc dot Gaussian is greater than the maximum, then make the maximum that value. And similarly, if sc dot Gaussian is less than the minimum value that we have found so far, make that minimum value that Gaussian curvature that we have found. If we do that, then we can now print to the console minimum dot to string, and then for example, maximum dot to string to figure out if the two values are the same. We can see that yes, the minimum matches what Grasshopper is telling us, the maximum also matches that. With this, it's great because now we have a range, we know where the minimum value is and where the maximum value is, and we can create a color that is an interpolation of that uh, of that of those two values. How are we going to do that? Well, I'm going to say that I'm going to store. Um, I'm going to store. Um, how are we going to do this? I'm going to store in a new in a new variable. I'm going to store. Well, let me think about this. Okay. Yes. So. Let me, let's do this first. What we're going to do is we're going to take all the curvature values and we're going to normalize them. Normalizing them, you may have seen in other videos, is a process where you take a collection of numbers, you look at the ranges, and then what you do is you modify those numbers to make sure that the whole collection of numbers has a range of values that goes from zero to one. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to proportionally change all these curvature values so that instead of going from minus 25 to 0.16, they all go from zero to one. And that is an, this is an operation that is extremely common because having a collection of numbers from zero to one then makes it very easy to translate to other domains, such as, for example, a color range between zero and 255. So I'm going to normalize those values. So what I'm going to do first here is I'm going to create a value, an array called normalized values that is going to be also is going to have the same size as the previous. Okay. And I'm also going to calculate the range, the difference between the minimum and the maximum. So that's going to be the difference is going to be the maximum value minus the minimum value that we have calculated so far. And now I'm going to iterate over all the elements. I is less than norm dot length and then I plus plus. And then for each curvature value, so double C is going to be curvature at that point. For each curvature value, I'm going to normalize them. Normalizing it means dividing the value that we have by the range in which it is offset by the minimum value. Um, I'm going to say, so I'm going to say double n is going to be equal to the value of the curvature minus its minimum, and then divided by the total range. I have explained this in some other videos. Uh, a card might be showing up somewhere, or um, or maybe not. I, I forget. But it's a very common operation. You can also Google that out there. And then once we have that, I just want to store that in the array norm is going to be equal to that value, that normalized value. Beautiful. Just to make sure 
I'm going to output here an n value and then I'm going to output that normalized. So that's going to be equal to normalize the array and then I there's an error here and then that's probably curvatures. Exactly, that's the error. Beautiful. So let's see if this is actually working. So I'm going to copy this and say normalized. And then you can see that this now has values of zero, it has values of 0 0.61, whatever. But if I plug that into the bounds, you can see that the whole list has values between zero and one, which is great, is very useful, uh, as we're going to see very soon. Okay, beautiful. And then last but not least, what I want to do now is I want to go over all the vertex colors, and then over all the vertices and add a color to the mesh that corresponds to this normalized value. How am I going to do that? Well, first of all, let me iterate over all the vertices of the mesh. I is less than mesh dot vertices dot count and then I plus plus, right? And then what I'm going to do is first of all, let me get the normalized value we have calculated before. So that's going to be norm dot y. Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to multiply this value by a by 255. So that instead of zero to one, it's now zero to 255. So double color is going to be equal to n to 255 times n. What that means is that now I know that that value has a color that is going to be between zero and 255. Now something that I need to do is I need to make sure because when I use colors in uh, graphic environments, colors, if they are represented between zero and 255, they don't have decimal part. So I need to make sure that this is actually an integer, which I can cast like this, and then I can change this value to this color, all right? And then once I have that, I can use that either as the red channel or the green channel or the blue channel or the three channels of a color that I'm going to add to the vertex colors of the mesh. So I have the mesh and I can say, can I add a can to the vertex colors, which right now is empty. Can I add a new color? And that color is going to be three RGBs. So because I already have, and you can see how they're integers here, integers, sorry, I keep mispronouncing that. So let's work only with the red channel right now. So I'm going to say color zero, zero. All right. And actually, I think that's it. Right. So let me run this. Oh, error. What's going on? Uh, cannot come, uh, cannot implicitly convert 104. Cannot convert from, oh yeah, because I need to do parentheses to convert the whole thing. All right. And what? What is going on here? Nice. So you can see how now I have a brighter red in the areas that have the most positive curvature. I have a medium red in the areas that are flat and I have a black in the areas that are the most negative curvature. All right. This is the part that I was not very happy about because if you think about it, Gaussian curvature is zero wherever things are very flat and Gaussian curvature is um, Gaussian curvature is positive where things are very concave and is negative where things are saddle like. So for Gaussian curvature, it would have made a bit more sense to have full black wherever things are very flat and to have a uh, full red wherever things are very positive and to have full some other color where things are very negative. Wait, can we change this? Can we change this in a way that we can make this happen? Okay, we are going to do this. Um, <laughs> hope this works out because I haven't prepared for this. But the fact that we're not getting black where the curve, the Gaussian curvature is zero is actually annoying me tremendously because I find it a very non rigorous approach to this plane curvature. So how are we going to change things to make this happen? Well, we're going to try the approach of 
using a red color for positive Gaussian curvature, that is when things are very concave like this, and to use a different color like green, for example, when things are saddle-like. And when they approach to zero, we're going to use black, okay? What does that mean? What it means is that instead of normalizing the whole thing, all the positive, all the negative values and all the positive values to a scale of zero to one, which means that the midpoint zero falls somewhere, in this case, like around 0.61, which is not very rigorous. What I'm going to do is I'm going to change the normalization rule so that this whole domain from minus 25 to positive 16 becomes a domain that goes from minus one to positive one so that we know that values that have originally zero, they stay at zero. Values that have minus 25, they become minus one. And then values that have positive 25, because it's bigger, we need to keep the scale the same in both directions. They also get a value of positive one. Let's take a look at how would we change that. It's going to be actually quite easy. What we're going to do here is we're going to say, instead of the difference, which we don't really care that much, actually. We're going to call this the range. And the range, what we're going to do is we're going to take the maximum value of the two ends. So we're going to say, well, I'm, I'm going to choose if 0.16 is bigger than minus 25 in absolute terms, then I'm going to take whichever one of those two. So I'm going to say math, I'm going to take the maximum value of both math the absolute value of the minimum and math the absolute value of the maximum. All right, so that's going to be the range. And let me comment all of this out because it's going to fail. And let me print the range to the uh, output to see that it's working. If I do this and I print the range, the range should be positive 25, which is what I was expecting. All right. Then for the normalization, I'm going to change the rule and I'm going to say, well, instead of divide, doing this, what I'm going to say is that the normalization is going to be the value that we have for curvature divided by that range, as simple as that, all right? And it's going to remain positive or it's going to remain negative. And if I do that, oops, something just happened here. Uh, the array length, uh, li line 94, normalization length. Well, why was this not? Okay. Okay. And I'm going to look now at the normalized values. And you can see that wherever the Gaussian curvature was zero, now it stays zero. And now whatever it had a tiny negative value, now we still have a tiny negative value, etc., etc. And if we look at the bounds, we can see that now it goes from minus one to 0.62, which is good. It's great because since the other end, the positive end doesn't have the same scale, we want to cap it at whatever the maximum value is. And then for the colors, I'm going to follow the following rule. What I'm going to do is I'm going to say, well, I'm going to get the normalized value. And then if, uh, let me, ah, Okay, where was I? Yes, I'm going to say if the if the positive value is greater or equal to zero, then what I'm going to do is I'm going to use the red channel. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say color is going to be equal to what I did before int of 255 times n. All right. And then I'm going to, to the uh, mesh vertex, to the vertex colors, I'm going to add a new color, which is going to be this on the red channel, zero and zero. All right. And if this is equal to zero, this is also going to be equal to zero, which is going to give me black, which is absolutely fine. Otherwise, if it's not greater than zero, then I'm going to use a very similar thing. But because colors cannot be negative, I'm going to multiply by minus 255 because this will be negative the color will become positive and then i can use it now but instead of using it in the red channel i'm going to use it for example in the green channel are you ready for this is this happening 
Boom. What? There you go. <laughs> ah, this looks so much better now. So let me turn this on. So this looks so much better now because now the flat areas are very dark, almost black. They should be black, actually. And then the saddle-like areas, the areas with negative Gaussian curvature are greenish. And the areas with positive Gaussian curvature are red. You know, and you can see that because of the scale of all this geometry, this area is much uh, brighter because it has greater negative value than this area, which is not so red bright because as we saw, the absolute value of the positive curvature is less. All right. If I crank up the size of the mesh, then the, you can see that we can see things a little clearer. All right. And I'm kind of not very happy with the, um, with the blue lines or whatever, but you can see, um, you can see that the color distribution changes a little bit because now here, look at this, it's actually quite interesting. The range changed because I just happen to be hitting points here that have a very, very strong positive curvature as opposed to these ones here. That is actually quite staying, quite interesting. So you can see how the definition of the mesh and where the vertex points land on the surface actually makes a big deal of a difference, you know, this point. So a very fine mesh, I guess, would make, um, yeah, you see, that is actually quite interesting. Beautiful. So, okay, so now you have the mesh and I'm actually going to keep all these values outside, perhaps not the negative one, um, but yes. So we have now a way to pre-visualize and if I were to turn off the, pre the mesh edges, now we can clearly see that, uh, we can clearly see the colors of the mesh as the pre-visualization, all right? This is a very, very common technique that is very commonly used for representing, for display data, for displaying data that is associated to a surface. When you do solar analysis and that kind of stuff, um, this is also the technique that is used. And actually, we have a video somewhere on a playlist about using meshes to display color information, such as, for example, solar analysis. There will be a card popping up somewhere here in the corner and in the description of this video. All right? Beautiful. And if this wasn't enough, can we move on to the last example that I want to do in this exercise, which is going to be taking a mesh, for example, the mesh that we generated in this component, and then analyzing the planarity of the faces of that mesh and rendering that also as mesh colors. Ah, wait, 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 actually, wait, we haven't actually rendered the mesh. What? We're outputting the mesh? But because we're outputting the mesh, it's the mesh is, oh yeah, we haven't actually rendered the mesh. Oh, that was terrible. <laughs> okay, sorry, sorry, sorry. Let's actually render the mesh because now look at what's happening. If I were to cancel all the outputs, if I were not to output nothing here, then this component is not pre-visualizing anything. So you see, if it was just pre-visualization, I wouldn't be seeing anything. So I need to actually add that to the code. So. How, how are we going to do that? We're going to add the overrides. We're going to add the floating global um, render mesh, for example. I'm going to call this here. And then I'm going to also make sure that where after all these calculations, I pass the mesh with the false colors to the render. All right. And now, remember, we were using draw viewport wires for geometry that is linear. The whole point of this exercise was actually to use the other method. <laughs> it just took us an 45 minutes to build all the code. But now that we have the mesh with the false vertex colors, now we can say arguments, display, draw mesh with false colors. It's just as simple as that. And I'm going to use here the render mesh. OK. And if I run this, we do see the exact same thing. But if I were to not output anything, right, then this component, I turn it on and off. You can see that the native pre-visualization of this component is the mesh with the rendered, um, with, the, with the colors. And something that I need to not forget to do, okay, 
something that I need to not forget to do is to um, make sure that I that I properly pass a bounding box so that the whole mesh always stays in within the clipping area of my rendering. So that is just as simple as render mesh dot uh, get bounding box. And because I don't really need precision, I can do false and make the operation cheaper. And just for the sake of it, I'm going to still output the mesh and I'm going to output the curvatures and I don't need the normalized values probably. Oh, I can. Yeah, why not? The normalized values. Yes, it's kind of interesting. All right. Beautiful, very beautiful. OK, so here we go. Color, false color mesh technique for rendering curvature, for example. Let's move on to the last example where we're going to do a similar thing, but we're going to render the mesh with colors that correspond to the, um, <clears throat> the planarity of the faces of a mesh. So building on the same mesh that we have output in, output in the component before, I have created, I just taken, I'm just taking the mesh and at this point the false, the colors that it has, I don't really care about them at all, I could actually write a component to clear the vertex colors of a mesh that could actually be interesting and super easy to do, but you can probably do that uh, as a viewer. So what I created was this C-sharp script that takes a mesh. And what I would like to do is to, to show as a preview with a set of colors, the planarity of the faces in this mesh. So what I'm going to do is I started this component already that takes the mesh. It has these two components, these two outputs P, which is going to be the values of planarity, right? And then N, which we're going to use similar to what we did before, which is going to be the normalized values that we're going to output throughout the process. And then in order to get this done, the first thing that we're going to do is for each face in the mesh, we need to compute, we need to compute the planarity. Planarity is not a... Uh, there's no, it's not like a Gaussian curvature that is very clearly defined. Planarity can be defined as whatever we want to define it as. And one of the easiest and uh, best ways of defining planarity is if you have four points measuring the offset of one of those points from the base plane that the other three form. I'm going to explain how that works. But let's start by building the scaffold, which is going to be, I'm going to create a, an array that is going to be called offsets, all right, and I will explain in a second. And I'm going to initialize it to the amount of faces that we have in the mesh. So that's going to be m, so that's going to be m dot faces dot count, uh, length count, length count, exactly. All right, then what I would like to do is I'm going to iterate over all the faces, i is less than zero, i is less than m, dot faces dot count and then i plus plus and then for each one of the faces i would like to calculate as a value i would like to calculate the offset all right and for this because it's going to be a fairly involved operation i'm actually going to create myself a method to calculate this i'm going to call it planarity i don't have it yet but i'm just designing what it would look like so for this, I would probably want to give it the mesh. I would probably going to give it the index of the face that I want to calculate planarity for. And I think that should probably be it. All right. So now let me create here a function that is going to be a public function. It's going to be accessible by everyone. It's going to return a number. It's going to be called planarity and it takes a mesh and it takes an integer for example, called ID which is going to be the ID of the face. I'm actually going to write here face ID. All right. And here we're going to perform the calculations of that planarity. All right. What is that calculation going to look like? Well, let's take a look diagram. Of course, we're going to sketch as we typically do. It's very useful. So first of all, we're going to do this for meshes inside of Rhino because Rhino accepts meshes that have quad faces, which is actually quite unique. Typically, many other environments will only allow you to work with meshes that have triangles as faces. And we know that triangles are always planar. So all this work that we're doing right now here 
would be kind of useless. So we're going to focus on those faces that are quads, that have four vertices as opposed to three, where the, where the triangle will always be planar. So if we think of those faces, we can see how four vertices always will form a quad face that may not necessarily be planar because one of the vertices may, off be, may be off their plane. So what does that mean? It means that for any four vertices, I can always choose three of the vertices form a plane between those three vertices and then calculate how far away the fourth vertex is from that, um, from that plane that I've calculated. Now, how do I do that manually? Well, I could do, I could use Rhino, take planes, calculate offsets from planes, blah, blah, blah. But you know me already, and this is advanced development in Grasshopper. So we're going to use a little bit of vector algebra to make this process more optimal, faster, and also more elegant. So what is that going to be? The way that's going to be is that in order to calculate this offset, first of all, I'm going to create two vectors between three points in my face. Um, those, those three points can actually be whichever three points, all right? And then what I'm going to do is that I'm going to calculate the cross product of those two vectors. The cross product, if you remember, is a vector that is perpendicular to the two vectors that generated the cross product. So what that means is that vector is going to be perpendicular to the plane that is formed by the three points or the two vectors that generate that we created from those three points. And now what we can do is what we can do is take that point and project the point on top of the cross product vector. How do we do that? We can do that very easily by creating another vector that goes from the first point of the three to this point and then projecting that vector on top of the cross product vector. That projection can be done using the dot product of two vectors. And um, I forget if I have, I think I have cards that speak about all of this. So maybe the card will be showing up on the corner or there will be videos. I, I have other videos talking about, there will be video links in the description um, if you want to know more about these geometrical relationships between vectors, okay? So we're going to do that very easily. So how are we going to do that? Well, first of all, we're going to say, I'm going to get the face, I'm going to get the face. Uh, <clears throat> I'm going to get the face. So mesh face, face is going to be equal to m dot, sorry, m dot faces with an ID of the face ID. All right, so mesh face is a structure that gives us information about the face in right. And then what I can do right away is I can say if face dot is triangle, then return zero. Return zero because it's going to be a flat surface. There's no offset in, there's no vertex that has an offset between the other three. Otherwise, if it's not, then we can do some calculations. So we're going to call the vertices, we're going to call the vertices, uh, let's assume that they're going to be in clockwise order. So this is going to be A, B, C, and D. All right, and let's assume that they have this nice orientation. So what we're going to do is, first of all, I'm going to create a vector 3D, which is going to be A, B, and it's going to be equal to face dot B minus face dot A. All right, a vector that goes between those two points. I'm going to create, I'm going to be a little lazy here. So I'm going to create a vector AD, which is going to be equal to face D minus face A. All right, and I'm using the implicit operator just to speed things up a little bit. And last but not least, because I will need it, now that I'm at it, I'm also going to create the vector AC because I'm going to need it farther down the road. So here, var vector AC is going to be equal to face C minus face A. All right, those are the vertices of the, actually, no, wait, 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 wait. I am not, so face dot A, this is an integer, integer. Oh, this is pointing to, okay. So I need to redo this, sorry. So 
so that would be mesh dot faces and the face that is at face at the id face dot a all right and then that's b and then m dot face oh what have i done maze and then face dot a all right and then i'm going to do the same here and here here and here and i'm going to close 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 and close all right beautiful i have the three vectors now so now what i can do is i can calculate the cross product between a b and a d to calculate the perpendicular so the cross product is going to be again i'm going to be lazy here instead of typing everything i'm just going to say the cross product is going to be vector 3d dot the cross product between a b and a d all right beautiful and then what i'm going to do is i'm going to unitize this vector i'm going to do that because in order to calculate the proper length of a c projected on top of the perpendicular vector the perpendicular vector needs to be unitized it's part of how this works so i'm going to unitize it and then after that what i'm going to do is i'm going to calculate the projection of a c on top of the cross product by using the dot product so that could be vector 3d dot dot product but as you can see we don't really have the dot product as a static method in the vector 3d class that is because rhino out of the box uses the simple multiplication sign as the dot product operator so what we can do is we can say ac which is the vector i'm going to multiply it by the cross product and this operation is the dot product all right and then beautifully what we can do now is that now that we have that dot product what we can do is we can return the absolute value of this of this vector all right which, which is not a vector it's actually a a double let me actually do that just in case so there is no and let me yeah let me make sure that the cross product is a vector and the, this is a double so that there's no confusion i'm going to you i'm going to be using the absolute value because it might be the case that point c may actually be right here and that the projection may actually be negative but since for us in a planarity terms whether if the offset is in one direction or the other it doesn't really matter and if we actually multiplied did the cross product between the two other vectors in a different order the vector will be pointing in the other direction it doesn't really have a meaning for us we just want the absolute value of that distance so that's why we are going to um, return the absolute value here okay and then so that is a vector that is a function that calculates planarity or the offset for a mesh and a particular phase id and for offsets in the y position i want to store this value uh, let me output that so that we can take a closer look and see if things are going well so that's going to be offsets i'm going to run this i'm going to <laughs> I already have an error, so that sounds great. And let me plug in here some panel to take a look at the error. Mesh face operator, blah, blah, blah. Uh, cannot be applied to open that Rhino mesh face and Rhino mesh face. Okay, so what have I done wrong? So, yes, okay, so yes, you're right. So this. When we say, when we access the A, B, C, or D property of a face, what that is giving us is the ID of the vertex that is in that face. So using that ID of the vertex to get a face is actually not, uh, is actually not cool. So what we actually want to do is we want to get the vertex. And then also you cannot subtract a face from another face. That doesn't make sense as an operation, but you can subtract two vertices and then get a vector between them. All right. Okay. And we still have a problem. What is going on? Mesh does not contain a definition for vertex. Sorry. Ah, vertices. 
Wow, it's been a long stream today. Sorry, vertices. There you go. And okay, so now it's working. So now we can see that we have all those values of the offsets. And let me take a look at the bounds of this. So oops, oopsies. <laughs> so I'm going to copy this, I'm going to bring it here. And then we can see that basically no face is really planar. That's interesting. At least all of them has a tiny, they have a tiny bit of, of an offset. What if I crank this down? Will all these ones become planar? Now we have something that is almost very, very close to planar, but no quad, it's exactly purely planar, which is also quite interesting. But anyway, so I'm going to keep this value high so that I get a lot of non-planarity from these faces here. And okay, so we have all those values. What is the next thing that we're going to do? What we're going to do is that we're going to normalize those values as we did before. So what are we going to do? We're going to, for this one, we're going to get the, we're going to find the maximum value. We don't care about the minimum because in this case, when we normalize, we want to keep zero at zero. So we want to keep faces that don't have any offset. We want to keep them as like that, even if in our collection, we don't have any. So I'm going to say double, dot minimum value and then here if if off if off is greater than maximum value then make maximum value this value of the offset so that we calculate the maximum and now we're going to calculate the normalized values and that's going to be equal to a new double array with the same amount of elements and then we're going to do a for loop where we're going to iterate over all the faces. So i is less than norms dot length and i plus plus. And then for each value, we're going to normalize it. So we're going to say we have to do this in a second for loop because we need to know which is one is the maximum value before we do the normalization. And we don't know that until we have finished going over all the faces. So that's why it's two separate for loops as opposed to doing the whole thing in just one. <clears throat> so now what we're going to do here is we're going to say normalize values in the i position is going to be equal to in the offsets, whatever value, and we're going to divide this by the maximum. In this case, we don't divide by the range. We don't divide by anything, but because we know that we have no negative values and because we want to keep zero wherever it is. All right. And then let's output now here norms. Um, and then let's take a look at that. So if that makes sense. So tiny values, tiny values. And then let's take a look at the range of values for the normalized values. Now it's from something a little smaller to one. Okay, so that looks great. And with this, I think we are probably quite ready to, we're probably quite ready to, um, to now display those colors on as part of the preview. So I'm going to turn the preview on. All right. And then I'm going to explain how we're going to do this, which is going to take a little bit of extra effort as opposed to the previous example. For this example, we're not going to be able to use the technique that we used before of the false colors in the mesh exactly as we used it before for the following reason. Think about this, because what we're trying to represent is the planarity of the whole face. The technique that we were using before was associating color values to individual vertices. What that means is that if I choose a color for this vertex, for this vertex, for this vertex, this one, this one, this one, this one, this one, this one, what would end up happening is that for, let's say, for example, that we choose a very high color for the corners, a very strong red and a very strong white for the center of the mesh. What we would get when that mesh gets color and render is something like this. We get right now and the graphics environment does some color interpolation between the vertices of the mesh so that throughout the face, within the face, the color changes in a gradient way, in a linear way, and <clears throat> makes some areas of the face, makes them darker, 
or makes them lighter based on the vertex colors. And that is not exactly what we want here. What we want here is for each face, what we will want is to have a solid, solid color that represents the planarity of that face. And the next phase, we want to have some other solid color. We don't want any of these interpolation transitions, etc., etc. So in order to render that pre-visualization, we're not going to be able to work by applying vertex colors to the whole mesh as we did before, but we're going to, fo to follow, we're going to have to use the following technique, which is going to be for each phase of the mesh, we're going to go face by face. And what we're going to do is we're going to create a new mesh that is just the four vertices of the face that we're looking at, and that is only going to have that one face. So for that one mesh, what we're going to do is to the four vertices, we're going to add the exact same vertex color, whatever we calculated in this case, we're going to add the exact same color so that the color of that face, which is not a face anymore, it's a full mesh that only has this one face, so that the color is homogeneous. There's no interpolations. And then we're going to repeat this process for every single face. We're going to create new meshes for each one of the faces, the faces that it's only the face itself. We're going to apply the vertex color to the four vertices and we're going to achieve a solid color without interpolations between, um, between those vertices. So in a way, we're cheating a little bit because instead of representing a mesh with vertex colors, we're basically representing as many meshes as faces our original mesh has. And then for each one of those tiny meshes, I'm coloring the four vertices with the same color so that we have a flat, uniform color representation for that mesh. That we can do uh, pretty easily and pretty fast with the rendering engine. It takes a bit more of computing cycles, but it's not a very heavy operation, I think so. So let's see how to do that code-wise. We are back with our c -sharp script definition. I'm going to run it. I'm going to do the thing that we typically do, which is taking the mesh and saying render mesh and then making sure that um, making sure that we have values that are um, that have been passed here. So for example, I'm going to say render mesh is going to be equal to M. All right. But I'm also going to pass in all those values that I have calculated, especially the the norms one, the of the the calc the one that had uh, the normalized values. So for example, normalize offsets, and I'm going to make sure that normalize offsets is equal to this array that we that we that we generated. And we I do this as I said in the previous video to scope that information so that it's available to all the other overrides, the ones that are going to be doing the pre-rendering and the pre-visualization. So now we're going to go to the draw viewport meshes, which is I'm going to remove the actual wire ones. And I'm going to here write the base code that we're going to need in order to render each one of the faces of the original mesh as a full mesh by itself. What is that going to look like? Well, it's going to look something like this. First of all, here, I'm going to iterate over all the faces in the mesh. So I equals zero, I is less than render mesh dot faces dot count, and then I plus plus, all right? And then what I first, what I could do is I could calculate the color that I want to assign to this, uh, to this particular face that I'm going to be rendering. Uh, as we said before, I can take the normalized value, is, that's going to be normalized offsets at the value of i, and then what I can do is I can calculate the value of the color as an integer, I'm going to make sure that it, that's clear, and I can do integer of 2055 times that normalized value. Okay, so that could be something that I can do. I can, I can, for example, yes, and I can calculate that. And that's going to be either red or green, or we can we can figure out how to do that. All right. And then what I would like to do now is from my general mesh, the one that has all the faces, I need to extract 
one mesh that is basically the four vertices of the face that I'm looking at and the vertex colors applied to that mesh. So because that sounds like an involved operation, I may want to create a function that does that. So let me prototype this. So I would want what I want is a mesh. So I'm going to call that M. And let me imagine a function that creates a mesh from a face. And it takes, for example, it's going to take the full mesh that I need, it's going to take the ID of the face that I want to extract, and it's going to take the color that I want to apply to the vertices. All right. If I have this mesh and this mesh becomes this sub mesh of the original one, then I will be able to use what I did before, which is rx.display.draw draw mesh with false colors and the mesh that I have extracted from the original one, all right, which already contains the vertices. This is, we're still designing this, we're, we haven't implemented this. But then the condition is that we need a function that given a mesh and given the ID of a face extracts a new mesh with vertex colors in there, all right? That's going to be actually quite simple to do, a little tedious, but it's actually quite simple to do. So let me say, I'm going to create, oh, don't, no shouting here. I'm going to create that function that is going to return a mesh and it's going to be called mesh from face. The, it's going to take as an input a mesh, it's going to take as an input the face ID, it's going to take as an input uh, the color as an integer, and then we will use convert that here as well. And, um, and what are we going to do now? Okay, so let's start simple. First, I'm going to create an empty mesh, all right, with nothing inside of it. So new mesh. The next thing that I'm going to do is uh, from the mesh that came in as an argument, I'm going to extract the face that I'm interested in. So mesh, mesh face face is going to be equal to mesh.faces and face ID. So now I have the face from the original mesh that I want to turn into a new mesh. So uh, you know what, let me do that here. So now to the new mesh that I have created, the first thing that I need to do is I need to add the four vertices of this face. So how is that going to do? Mesh vertices add and the vertex that I need to do uh, that I need to <laughs> add is from the original one, the original mesh, vertices, that one that is at position face dot A. All right. And I'm going to do this three times. All right, B and C. And because the mesh may have triangular faces, why not? Right? Well, I, at this point, I'm going to check if, uh, if we're good. So I'm going to say if uh, face dot is triangle, if this face is a triangle, then I'm going to stop here and I'm going to say m dot um, faces, then add a face between the vertices in position. So the, the vertices in position zero, one and two. So because I added them in order, they're going to maintain the same order. All right. Otherwise, if it wasn't a triangle, then I need to add my fourth vertex. So that's going to be D. And I'm going to add a face between vertices in position zero, one, two, and three, the one that I just added here. All right. At this point, I have a mesh that has one, two, three, or four vertices, and that it has a face between the vertices that I have generated. So this mesh is already valid. I could return it and I could render it, right? It's just a tiny mesh with three or four vertices and one face. The only thing is that before returning M, which is what I'm creating, what I want to do is I want to add vertex colors because I want that to be rendered on the screen nicely. So to the four, to the three or four vertices, I need to add the vertex color here. How am I going to do that? Well, I'm going to say, well, I could do the same thing. I could do if else, if else, but I'm going to be a bit more programmatic here for i is equal zero. 
i is less than m dot vertices dot count. So I'm going to iterate over however many vertices this new mesh has. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to do m dot vertex colors dot add, and I'm going to add a new vertex color to that. Uh, so here we have the value from zero to 255. So let me use that as the red, for example. So color or yes, let me add that as red, for example. And wait, I think, is that it? Because we have the function and this is already pre-implemented. Can we do this? Is this working? Ah, oh, I got an error. <laughs> 128, error at 128. So that's a norm offset. So I have a typo here, norm offsets. And this is, what it is working. It's working. <laughs> Look at this thing. How beautiful is this? So now we have in our mesh, which has been pre-visualized here, so I can turn it on and off, all right? And we have faces that are very bright, if very bright red, if they're very non-planar, and faces that are very dark, if they are very planar. What's interesting is that turns out that these ones are fairly planar because of the geometry of how I've generated the surface. This, and because of the discretization, this faces also tend to be very planar, whereas the ones that are in the slope of the mountain, if you will, are, they have a pretty large offset. So if I were to change the discretization here, you can see, you how nice is this, right? <laughs> oh, this is very nice, actually. I forgot how cool was this. Yep, 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 yep. All right. Now you can get a bit more creative with colors and then do like a, uh, like a rainbow of colors, go from black to white, go from, I don't know, but, um, but yeah, that's actually pretty nice. Look at this and look at these crosses, how they represent. So maybe, yeah. So it looks like this worked out. <laughs> All right. How awesome is this? Like seriously, like, why do you not, how does someone not want to spend all their time and their life doing this kind of stuff? Huh? <laughs> Beautiful. Okay. So let's wrap this up. It was kind of a long exercise, but I hope you've learned a bunch of stuff in on the way. We made a custom rendering for vectors, which is somewhere here. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. Wait, wait, wait. Something I forgot here is that we need to add we need to add the bounding box here. Yes. So remember, render mesh dot um, get bounding box in false. All right. Just to just just to wrap things up. So we have the vector. We have we have the vector. We have the curvature analysis. We have for the surface. We have the um, the Gaussian curvature. And for the same surface, we have the planarity of the faces. Okay, so this has been pretty good for practicing pre visualizations, but also like all this whole like mesh geometry rendering false colors was actually a pretty interesting exercise. I have to say, I hope you learned a lot with this. Anyway, this ended up being more of a computational geometry exercise than perhaps the previous ones, but I thought it was pretty cool anyway. Um, without further ado, yeah, we're going to move on to the next video in this series. We're going to learn more about advanced scripting and development in Grasshopper. But in the meantime, if you liked what you saw, you may want to consider liking this video or subscribing to the channel or dropping a message or sharing some of your fantastic work with us on the Discord server where we have conversations throughout the week offline. Okay. All right. Beautiful. Thank you very much. And I'll see you on the next video. Bye-bye.